tell us for now, before we get to the role of Buttigieg and lobbyists and the Obama and Trump administration, all of which is relevant to these questions, what do we know about this derailment and the harm that it's causing in this community? Well, what we know is that this train was carrying uh, various toxic chemicals, including vinyl chloride. Vinyl chloride is, was actually a part of a big explosion, a big der der derailment and leak in New Jersey uh, many years ago, which led to some of the uh, push for uh, rail safety rules that we'll discuss soon. But vinyl chloride is a acknowledged carcinogen. Uh, there was a controlled uh, burn of the uh, of the carcinogen, uh, there's questions about why it was in, why it was sort of detonated, but upon impact of the derailment, there were reports of hundred foot flames. Uh, there were uh, you know it was a it was a huge explosion, and yet and again we'll discuss this, but the train wasn't even being classified as a high hazard flammable train, even though it was carrying uh, these toxic uh, chemicals, these obviously flammable chemicals. So you see the footage, we showed a little bit of it. It's obviously very alarming. You can imagine how frightened people in these communities are. I remember 9-11 when it happened, I was living in Manhattan and we were all assured by health authorities that there was no risk at all to our long-term health from being exposed to those burning, uh, that burning building, that collapsed building, the plane that blew up. And yet, as it turned out, many of the workers, the first responders, 9-11 had very serious health risks along the way. One of the things you've been pointing out is how little media coverage there is of this. Pete Buttigieg did several Sunday shows and was not even asked about it. Here's a headline from uh, the Lever News in which you say, Lever Weekly, the man responsible, and you show there a picture of Pete Buttigieg. What questions should he have been asked on the Sunday show tour about what's happening in Ohio? Well, beyond the questions of, of how did the accident, uh, the derailment happen, there should be questions, uh, I think, about what were the uh, government policies that were changed in the lead up to this that have any relation to this? Uh, and, and the story is basically this. After a series of derailments in the early, uh, excuse me, the early 2010s, there was a push to put in more uh, safety rules for trains carrying hazardous materials. Uh, and when the, uh, it was in, during the Obama administration, and when the Obama administration put forward its, its proposal, it asked for public comment. Uh, and the National Transportation Safety Board came to the Obama administration and basically said, listen, this rule needs to be broad. It needs to cover all sorts of different chemicals, uh, including what's known as class two chemicals, which were on this train. Uh, the Obama administration subsequently- And just, just let me interrupt uh, there. So essentially, cl class two chemicals, I assume these classes of chemicals are divided based on how hazardous, hazardous they are if they were to leak. Is yes. that right? That's, that's exactly right. And, okay. and so what the Obama administration decided to do was to uh, limit the rule to mostly cover oil trains, trains carrying crude oil, and did not expand the rule to cover class two uh, chemicals, like, as an example, vinyl chloride. Uh, so they weakened the rule, they narrowed the rule to who, which trains it applies to. And then uh, the rail industry lobbied against the other part of the rule that would have required uh, better breaks on the trains that the rule applied to. The idea was that even if, even if the rule uh, didn't end up applying to a train like the one in Ohio, the, the push was on to get the rail industry to start using what's known as ECP brakes. Right now, the brakes in the United States are mostly Civil War era brakes, if you can believe it. The idea being that ECP brakes, electronic brakes, uh, are better at deterring uh, and mitigating derailments. The Trump administration gets in, it repeals that part of the rule. All of that becomes what happened, or, or, or the context for what happened in Ohio. A train that's carrying these toxic chemicals is not even classified and regulated as a high hazard flammable train, does not have these uh, brakes on it. And then the question becomes, well, well, in the interim of Trump repealing it, and today, what happened? Well, Pete Buttigieg, as Secretary of Transportation, did not move to reinstate the Obama era rule, did not move to expand the original rule to cover obviously high hazard flammable trains. Uh, and Pete Buttigieg, in fact, the agency has been considering a proposal to weaken, to further weaken brake safety rules. And this is all at the behest of the industry's lobbyists. Yeah, so let me focus on that part. Um, you know, I often am observing that 
there's this kind of mythology that the two parties can never agree on anything and they never can. They're always at each other's throats. They have radically different views of the world. And here you have three successive administrations, two Democratic, one Republican, who are essentially serving the same industry in exactly the same way, namely by repealing regulations they find costly. If you look at the first instance of this, which is the Obama administration, I remember very well the 2008 presidential campaign of President Obama and the 2012 presidential campaign as well against John McCain and Mitt Romney. And one of the causes he was most passionate about defending was the need to protect our environment. This is one of the differences we're told between the two parties is that Democrats are more devoted to environmental protection. Why would an administration so devoted to environmental protection scale back regulations that can only have one effect, which is lowering the safety requirements against accidents like this that could harm the environment. Why would that happen? Well, look, in, in fairness, the Obama administration did put forward uh, a, a rulemaking process to put in place some rules. So I think that, that's a, that is a difference, but I certainly think spotlighting the fact that they put forward a proposal there's industry pushback, and then the proposal is narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. So a train like this and trains like it all across the country are exempt from those rules. I mean, what you're seeing there is that both parties' administrations have tended to side with the corporate lobby. Uh, and the question now becomes, after a disaster like this, Will that continue? Remember, the original Obama rule came in response to a series of derailments. So we're in this kind of cycle of a crisis happens, the government uh, in, that's in power wants to look like it's responding, the devil ends up being in the details, the response, the first initial response gets a headline, the devil's in the details in the rulemaking, the response actually gets limited and narrowed, then another administration comes in when people aren't in, and it repeals a rule arguing about cost, uh, and here we are. So the real question, the, I think, is both to understand what happened and then ask what is the current regulator right now? What have they been doing? What will they do? And again, the, the, the Buttigieg-led transportation department is considering a rule to weaken train brake safety uh, and, and, and testing of those brakes and has not proposed to reinstate or expand the rules that were even on the books in the past. And so then the question becomes, well, why? Why are they not doing that? Right, that's my question. Goes, again, exactly. Why, to, who why, do they, why, who do they why, answer to? Why? Exactly. That's my question. So you have, that's exactly what I mean. So you have the Obama administration, they get into office. They do, as you say, seek to introduce this new set of regulations designed to make this industry safer. They conclude that certain types of safety mechanisms are necessary. The, the industry, of course, wants to fight against those because each one of those regulations takes out of the profits of this industry. They come to the government and they say, with barely anyone paying attention, these are things that got very little attention. This it was not part of the public debate. We don't want this particular regulation. We want you to keep this regulation away from us at least. And the Obama administration does it. The Trump administration appeases them even more why is that? Why does this industry have so much power to, 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 to dictate the rules and regulations that govern their own industry? It's, it's a great question, and I want to add one thing here. It's a particularly great question because the breaks that we're talking about were touted by the same industry a few years uh, before the Obama administration. This is the, one of the craziest parts of the story. Norfolk Southern was touting electronic brakes in the late 2000s, saying these are great, uh, a great safety innovation, they can make our trains safer. The moment the government moved to mandate these brakes, the rail industry writ large said, oh, the cost is too high. P.S., the cost they were citing was about $3 billion, which in a typical year is about two weeks of operating revenue of the industry, not a very huge cost. And the answer to your question is, is because I think both parties when the public isn't looking, when both parties face pressure and demands from powerful moneyed interests, both parties tend to want to give to those moneyed interests what those moneyed interests really want. Again, especially when the public is not looking. And one other point on this, I think that what the politicians fear publicly 
uh, both the culpability for disasters, but also the rail industry in particular being able to say, oh, this regulation is going to harm the economy. This regulation is going to mean uh, your family uh, doesn't get food on the table because of the supply chain or presents at Christmas. So this industry in particular, which is a kind of monopolistic in industry, is able to make an argument that politicians most fear, a.k.a. if you touch us, if you regulate us, it will harm your constituents who will blame you. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, I think there is such a thing as overregulation. You can imagine a government going wild and imposing all kinds of regulations that are unnecessary that create red tape. Probably has happened before. It's not like it's a made-up concern. But at the same time, when you're talking about an industry that's carrying extremely dangerous chemicals, if there's any time that the government has an interest in making sure that's being done safely and not on the cheap, that would be one of those times. Now, I had mentioned, David, that you were on our show a couple weeks ago talking about the debacle with Southwest Airlines, the way in which uh, hundreds of thousands of people were stranded. It seemed very clear at the time that, of course, that falls in the lap of the transportation secretary. That's whose job it is to make sure that the nation's aviation industry is working properly. And I remember at the time, there was this attempt to do everything to shift blame away from people to judge, just like there is now, and say, oh, it's because of this archaic uh, computer system that Southwest Airlines uses. And you were here making, essentially making a similar argument about what role Pete Buttigieg had to play in all of that happening. Explain what that was and what the through line is to this critique as well. Look, the Secretary of Transportation has a huge amount of power as the chief regulator of the nation's transportation systems, in particular, the airlines and the railways. Uh, these companies, whether it's Southwest Airlines or Norfolk Southern or anyone else, are making corporate decisions inside of a regulatory framework. So in the airline situation, Southwest Airlines is making the decision not to upgrade its computer system, uh, premised on the idea that the chief regulator of the airlines, the Secretary of Transportation, is not going to, in any serious way, financially punish them when the system melts down. In other words, the, the company is making the decision that, yeah, we may screw over consumers, but ultimately, if our system melts down, uh, uh, the system that we haven't invested in because we don't want to make the expenditure, we won't really face much of a price for it. It's the same thing with the, with the railways. The railway companies, again, uh, also a monopoly, they basically look out at a landscape where they say, listen, if, the, if, the, if we don't have to put out money to, to improve our brakes, uh, because we've made sure the department isn't forcing us to do that, and we have a derailment, uh, we're going to get a slap on the wrist at best. We're not going to be really held all that liable, certainly not at a level that is a, is a financial deterrent, because the regulator has, has not regulated us and will not regulate us. There's no deterrent there. And I want to add one other thing, the, the monopolistic part of this. Ultimately, you could say, listen, if a, if a company wants to try to behave like that, even with, uh, and regulators don't want to regulate them, then it's, uh, in, in many industries, you could say, well, at least the consumers will punish them, right? The consumers will say, I'm not going to buy that product. I'm not going to use that service. But especially when it comes to transportation monopolies, the consumers, the clients, don't have a choice, right? To how many different, uh, on the airline situation, how many different routes only have one or two carriers? On the railway system, it's even worse. If you have to take a good from point A to point B, you don't get to choose whether it's Norfolk Southern or another competitor. It's basically a monopoly. So you've got the worst of all worlds. The, the, the company isn't being regulated. Uh, and the and the consumers don't have a choice. It is basically, essentially, the company has all of the power if the regulator is not regulated. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.